There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No. Prevost, we hitting the road, boys. <laughs> that took me back a long way. Did that take you back? It's a good song right there. Yes, it is. I sung that in years. I remember being in a service, and they were I think they were singing that song, and there was a screamer sitting behind me. Oh, yeah. And all at once, during the chorus, she just, wah! And, and I remember jumping, because I thought the rapture had taken place. Like, that was the trumpet, and I had been left. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been in those services where the Spirit got to moving. And whether it was a squirrel running up someone's uh, overall leg or whatever it was, you, you usually had to pretend like you were on board with it or people would start looking at you like something was wrong with you. They'd come lay hands on yeah. you and start praying for you. Yeah, you were less spiritual. So you just had to start, you know, getting on with the program. Mark, you didn't grow up with any of that, did you? Oh, I didn't grow up with that in church, but I grew up with it in the car. My dad played the cathedrals and the Kingsmen and Gold City and the Oak Ridge Boys and all of them. No, but we're talking about the shouting. Oh, no, but I've read about it in sociological discussions. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. you got to count for something. Yeah, but you've got to experience it. You can't That's... pontificate on an esoteric theory. Can I do it later? Can I experience it another time? I'm pretty tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We're your hosts, Brian Edwards, Nathan Cravat, Mark Ward. I'm J.C. Groves. Good to be here with you again for week number three with our special guest, Mark Ward. Mark, thanks for coming back for week three. Thanks for singing with me. You know, I didn't realize when I left the East Coast, I was giving up nearly all four-part singing. I almost never get to do it. And I grew up listening to Southern Gospel and singing barbershop and singing in choirs. Thank you. Well, maybe on episode four, we could talk Brian into doing a barbershop quartet to start. Actually, that's his contractual obligation. I am not staying unless we do that. <laughs> we already threw out all the W's in the M&M's for you. So. Well, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody enjoyed the three episodes of the uh, King James Onlyest uh, conversation. <laughs> He's it's not going to do the four. three great episodes. <laughs> Guys, we are three episodes in to our discussion on the King James Version and Modern Translations. And we've been talking about this book, but I want to go ahead and show it to everybody. This is one of the most important recent books I've read on the King James Only controversy. And this book is called Authorized, the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. And I want to recommend this book so highly that if you have someone that is in the King James Only movement, strong proponents of that position, or maybe they're studying it out for themselves, or maybe they've come out and they just don't know really how to talk to other people about it because you take a lot of heat when you walk away from that position. So get this book. It is awesome. I actually, Mark, recommended this last night to one of our listeners. She messaged us, I think at about 1130, then I was awake, obviously, and she said, uh, I need a book. I'm leaving the King James only position, but I, I don't really know how to verbalize this, and the first book I recommended to her, obviously, I was interviewing you the next day, but I said, you need to get 
the book authorized, and she typed it in and sent back a picture, and she said, is this the one? I said, yes. She said, I just ordered it, so you sold a book last night. And it comes with a small sliver of Free Life Soap. <laughs> yes. That's it. Free Life Soap, been keeping the RFP smelling good for a few months now. You can go to recoveringfundamentalist.org, click on the promo tab, Free Life Soap, use your promo code RFP, and get 20% off of your order. Mark, where can they get your book authorized? Um, they can get it wherever uh, books about the King James Only controversy by redheaded authors are sold, okay. yes. such as Amazon or probably not their local bookstore. But Logos.com has it in print and in Logos format and in audio, which was a lot of fun to do. And if you use the promo code RFP authorized, I asked my marketing team, because I work at the company, could you give them a discount? And I was happy they were going to give a 40% discount. Now is time to get it till May 1st. May 1st. And guys, getting back to our sponsor, I just got a text from our good friend, Dave Young, live, this is real time, live and in person, and you know what he wanted to know? What the promo code was for Free Life Soap on our website, so that's awesome. there we go. Dave Young is getting on board with the Free Life Soap Life. He's going to be smelling good. Yes, he preaching. is. Hey, we want to give a happy birthday a couple weeks late to the man that keeps the RFP rolling. Justin Knight had a birthday just a couple weeks ago, and we want to say happy birthday to Justin. Yeah, happy birthday, and, Justin. Uh, Justin is the man behind the scenes that does everything for the RFP. We talk into the microphone. Justin keeps us going, keeps the website up, keeps all of the uh, the extras on the website, like the tab that's on there right now for our RFP meetups that are coming this summer. Summer 2021 is going to be an incredible time for you to come and meet us. I don't know how incredible that's going to be, but we can't wait to meet you as we gather on June the 4th in Statesboro, Georgia, and also August 26th, 27th, and the morning of the 28th in Bourbon, Missouri. So we have our South meetup and our Midwest meetup. And I'll just tell you this, we are working on an East Coast meetup that I think is going to be pretty incredible. If things keep coming together, that's going to be a pretty cool one too. How do you get much more East Coast than Statesboro, Georgia? We're going to. Is it going to be in Savannah? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 45 minutes away true i think you're probably talking more northeast we'll go there man that's going to be super cool virginia beach mm, more north carolina ish oh wow that's outer great. banks come on baby we'll see in my mind i'm going to carolina and you won't do quartet but you'll sing that well, that's James Taylor. He's from North Carolina, and he's amazing. I tell you this, of the heart. James Taylor never sang that song as good as you just sang it. Oh. That was smooth. Who's James Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> Young people. Oh, I am excited about the meetup, so it's going to be fun. Uh, up there in Bourbon, Missouri with Matt Dudley. That's right up there where Matt's at. And It, it just doesn't get any cooler than Matt Dudley. I'm sorry. I'm sitting at the table with three cool guys right now. But Matt Dudley is yeah. one of the coolest human beings I've ever met. I love that dude. Oh, just to be around him, he's got the perfect fade on the haircut, the perfect cut on the beard. Like his beard, it looks like he could take it off at night and it would stand on its own and then he could just <laughs> put it back on the next day. Hey, it's very few guys I'm ever around that I just think when I'm standing there talking to him, this guy could kick my butt if he wanted to. Because, I mean, I grew up in a boy's home. I, I grew up fighting. Like I, I'm proud of that. But that dude, like, yeah. I'm not going to cross him. Like, he's he's the real deal. Matt's cool. Hanging out in Vegas with Matt, it's even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> hanging out with him in Bourbon, Missouri is even cooler. It's going to be fun. Come and hang out with us and Matt Dudley in Bourbon, Missouri, August 26th, 27th, and 28th. Guys, y'all ready to jump into week number three with Mark Ward? I'm ready. I'm excited. You ready, Mark? Yes. Ooh. Let's go! Three. You know what makes women stupid is college. Jesus was not a bartender. Hi, man. Two. You have lost your mind. Long tongue heifers have given me a lot more trouble than heifers wearing breeches. And you know that. Say amen right there. One. Let me tell you something, bozo. They'll be selling 
frost is in hell for this boy. Put on a pair of pink underwear. Amen. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years of age. Hi, man. Well, guys, jumping into episode three, we're dealing this week with dead words and false friends in the King James Version. Mark, why don't you explain that to us? In order to read your King James Bible with full understanding at the English level, okay, we're not yet talking about theology. We're just talking about getting the meaning that the King James translators tried to put into English. Everybody knows that there are words in the King James that we know we don't know. These I call dead words. The technical terminology would be obsolete lexemes. And if you go in your dictionary, if you go to an exhaustive one or go to the Oxford English Dictionary, it'll say obsolete right there. And so when you get to the word beray, B-E-W-R-A-Y, you know, I don't don't know that word. I've never heard anyone use the word. I've never read the word. I've never said the word. Is that in the King James Version? Mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing that one. It's in there. You didn't read the whole thing. Bye. Second book of the opinions. <laughs> yeah. Second Hezekiah. So, th- so that's the effect of language change, right? Some words just drop out of the language. And Satan didn't take them out. That's just what happens to all languages. Dead words. Like the word Leviathan. Yeah. So, you know, people who grew up on the King James, they know that word. And there was a famous book by, no, oh, this is terrible. The philosopher Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the namesake of Calvin and Hobbes, Hobbes. Uh, called the Leviathan. But uh, my question is, okay, what did Leviathan mean to people in 1611? Did they know that word? You can go back and using various scholarly tools like the Oxford English Dictionary, discover, was that a commonly known word back then? Sometimes you find it wasn't. They, w- they would have had to study this too. But often you find a word has just dropped out of the language in the last 400 years. Leviathan is actually used in Agent Carter, the Marvel TV show. That, that was, she was uh, Captain America's girlfriend, and they've got the show about her, and the, the agency or whatever, I haven't got that far in the show yet, but the agency that the bad guys is Leviathan. Well, that actually affirms it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and then you've got words that are kind of on the border, like beeves. Do you mind if I put you guys on the spot? Anybody ever heard or used the word beeves, B-E-E-V-E-S? Beeves and butthead? butthead. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get it in. <laughs> yeah. Look, we, we usually don't hold it together this long, Mark. We've done well. I'm surprised that you guys have gotten anything done for okay. any episode. Right, so go oh, ahead and ask joking. again if we know the word beef. <laughs> no, I, I want to leave that part in. That's funny. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard that word in, in real life beyond the King James? Only on MTV. Okay. It. So it's B E E V E S. And you have heard the word beef, right? I just spit. I am a Baptist. You did, um, all over me. Beeves was plural of beef, and it was cows. You can hear the B and V like bovine. Now, technically, this word is what's called archaic, not obsolete, because if you are, my church actually has a guy in it who is a bovine podiatrist. He cuts the toenails of cows. I'm not kidding. He, I asked him. Wow. This is an important I've job. I've never heard of that. <laughs> I asked him, have you ever used the word beeves? Oh, yeah, of course. So if you're a Texas rancher, you know the word beeves. How many people in your church, Brother Brian, are Texas ranchers? Or yeah. You know, actually not a single one. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So that word is effectively dead for them. And you can say, well, you ought to use, you ought to learn to use this word. It's still actually in the English language. You know, Texas ranchers know it. Or you could just say cows. And guess what? Everybody in here is going to understand. And edification requires intelligibility. So you go to the Trinitarian Bible Society, you go to DA Waite, you go to all kinds of King James only folks who will openly acknowledge that there are dozens, if not hundreds of words in the King James that are dead. And they helpfully give you long lists of them. This one I have from the Trinitarian Bible Society on my computer right now uh, goes into the 700s. Actually, I don't think all of them are dead words. That's a longer discussion. Um, And let's just stop and say, okay, we're all acknowledging this isn't ideal. I mean, right? Who translates a Bible using words that are no longer in the, what's called the current lexical stock? Nobody uses them. Nobody writes them, except maybe at the very edges of the language in very particular places like, you know, cattle auctions. Well, no, you don't do that. That's, That's a problem, right? And why is it a problem biblically? Because 1 Corinthians 14 tells us edification requires intelligibility. Can we can we have like a little moment of a quiz words that we can think of 
that are no longer in use that come from the King James? Because I'm thinking about the word emrods. Yeah. It's actually, and this is not going to be fun, but it's related to the word hemorrhoids. But <laughs> the, but that's dead. Nobody reads that. In, oh, I, was just, I just listened alive. to it. First King something and knows what it's talking about. For it's Sammy. taken us 56 episodes to say hemorrhoids <laughs> on the Recovering <laughs> Fundamentalist oh, podcast. <laughs> we missed such a great opportunity. I want to hear some more words. What, what comes to your mind? How about the word peradventure? No and, one says that. Right. Okay. So here, here's one thing the King James Only Brothers will say. They'll say, that one is so obvious from context, don't dumb the Bible down. You know, peradventure for a righteous man, someone would dare to die. Obviously, it means perhaps. And there are plenty of dead words that from context, you know, can mean only one thing. But I still want to say, you know, if there's anybody who misunderstands, why not use the word perhaps instead of peradventure? I don't know if this word fits in the dead category, but I, I've never understood what the word mandrakes means. Okay. This is a great question because there are several kinds of difficulty in any Bible translation, and mandrakes is going to appear in probably most of these current translations that we have. Why? Because people don't know what mandrakes are. Are they, you know, are these modern versions being hypocritical by putting hard, difficult words into the Bible when they said that's their whole reason for existing is, you know, getting rid of them? No. We have to distinguish between dead words and difficult or obscure things. Why don't we know what mandrakes are? Because we don't have mandrakes in our country. Why don't we know what the rock hyrax is? Well, we don't have that in our country. So what Bible translators typically do is if it's really just totally out of the realm of people's understanding, they'll put a footnote in, or they can rely on study Bibles, okay? I think mandrakes should stay. That's a difficult thing, not a difficult word. But if words are in a Bible translation and they're difficult because of language change, then I don't see any biblical reason to hold on to them. And I see every biblical reason to quietly, if need be, revise them to use words that people do understand today. So here's a word that a lot of our folks on Twitter don't like because the word anon. Uh -huh. But in Mark chapter 1, verse 30, it said, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and anon they tell him of her. Okay, so there's another one that I, I feel like, you know, growing up with the King James as I did, from context, I understood, well, that can only mean quickly. That's just like, but you might as well have said nonsense syllables. You could have said, um, and ergonomok with joy, they received the word. <laughs> and people would pick up from context what you mean. But the more that happens, the more words end up getting replaced. And, the, and there are these times where the context doesn't give you as much of a clue, like chambering and wantonness, right? Well, I know those are bad because they're in a, what's called a vice list, but I don't know what chambering is and wantonness, ah, that's, well, wanting stuff, you know, that's not good. As long as we have a word that people know, immorality instead of chambering. Use the word people know because edification requires intelligibility. One of my favorite words is the word what. And we still have the word wit to which it is related. And if you go back in the history, yes, etymologically, they're connected to a word for knowledge, even in German today, visa. And I'm certain that those are all related. But the etymology of a word is unknown to everybody who uses the language, except for a few nerds in there who care about this stuff. And even they don't know the etymology of all our words. Words don't mean what they used to mean. They mean what we mean by them now. All right, so I think we came up with a pretty good list of dead words or words that are no longer used. Words we know we don't know. Yeah, and, and no one really knows them. And when you read them, you explain them. And then... I've got a confession to make. As a younger preacher, I preached from verses and read words that I didn't know what they meant, and so I just never dealt with it. And maybe, I don't know that you've ever done that before, oh, surely. absolutely, yeah. And then JC's a youth pastor, so he does that all the time. But not only, I love you. You're right. But not only. Uh, I am too. <laughs> yeah. You're Lord. surrounded by youth pastors. Okay, bro. then, I, then I, I, totally, I totally battles. retract that. That statement, since uh, I'm outnumbered, and and JC is huge, but <laughs> not only are there there dead words or words that we no longer use, but you also, Mark, have this really cool concept that I've never heard anyone talk out, and that's this concept of false friends. You know, I think that you've never heard the label 
but you've heard the concept because you've you, probably everybody here, right, has heard somebody say, okay, he that now letteth will let doesn't mean he that now permits will permit or allow. It means actually that he who is stopping will stop them. Or another common one is prevent. It means come before in King James English. Or a really common one most people already know is conversation. You know, let your conversation be such as becometh. I can't remember the whole verse. That can't mean only your talk. It's your conduct. But there are times when the context is not enough of a tip-off to regular readers who you know, kind of don't know the, the, uh, the oral tradition, the Mishnah of the King James only world, and they'll come across conversation, you know, let, uh, you need to be uh, an example in, in word and conversation in spirit and in charity, right? And, and you might think in word and in conversation, why does it, why does it say it twice? That doesn't make sense. Um, there are in the King James false friends, these are words that we don't know we don't know. It's one thing for King James only leadership and followership, because they always say this to me. They always say, well, you need to not abet laziness. You need to just look up words that you know you don't know. And, and actually, if there were just a few of them, I think that's entirely reasonable. Plus, we've got mandrakes and plenty of other stuff that we don't really understand from the Bible world. So, you know, I run Bible study magazine. I'm not against studying. But then, in fact, they will say to me, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is an element of gall in people telling me this as the editor of Bible Study Magazine, but I try to respond humbly. I say, brother, I did this on Josh Tice's blog comments because he let me write an article on his blog once. I said, what did study mean in that context in 1611? Well, they all, you know, they don't know what to say. Well, it means hit the books. If you go look at the dictionary, study in that passage is a false friend. Here's how I know. If you look at the Greek, the same Greek that the King James translators were looking at, it's not like there's a textual variant here. It's, I'm going to use one Greek word, I think, in all this time, spudadzo. Okay? If you look at the way that word is used in the rest of the New Testament, it'll be translated even in the King James with words other than study, something like be diligent or make it your aim. In that passage, 2 Timothy 2.15, the King James translators were not saying, hit the books to show yourself approved. I mean, that's a good thing. But what they were saying is, be diligent to show yourself approved. Be diligent to demonstrate your approved status. And I can confirm this not only by first looking at the Greek. What did the Greek mean? Because the King James translators were excellent translators. They're not going to mess this up. But they were translating into their English. And how I confirm this finally, is to go to the only dictionary in existence that records the entire history of how English words have been used. I never heard of this in the King James only world. And it ought to be, if you're going to be King James only, you ought, you must know about the Oxford English Dictionary. Current dictionaries may or may not give archaic definitions. Even Webster's 1828 dictionary may or may not tell you what a, word, a given English word meant in 1611, but the OED will go all the way back to the beginning of history. It's a massive resource. It's very expensive. My local library has it, so I'm able to use it online for their system. And you go, you go look up study, and they're going to give you several senses that fit the Greek of the New Testament perfectly, that fit the context perfectly, such as be diligent, make it your aim. No mention of hit the books. That's a separate sense. And under those senses that fit the King James and fit the Greek, it's going to say obsolete. We still use the word study, but we don't use it in exactly with the exact same set of senses that the King James translators used. That is a false friend because you, you assume you know it. Who looks up the word study? The King James only folks don't know where they're supposed to look it up, for one thing, and they don't even know to look it up. Why, why look up words you already know? So that, that's a false friend because it's misleading through no fault of the King James translators. And hear me here, through no fault of contemporary readers. You are not a dummy for failing to know that. I did not know it until an embarrassing number of years of school had passed you know, through my brain, okay? That's what a false friend does. That happens because of language change. I, I experience what you're talking about on a different level. I have three daughters one daughter who's 17, and she was talking to me a little while back about spilling the tea. 
And I had no idea what she was talking about, that that's give us what you know. Let us know the information maybe that we're not supposed to know. It's, it's kind of a terminology for, for give us the gossip. I, I think you can relate that to what you're talking about biblically. Yeah, that would be an idiom a figure of speech, an expression that's common. That kind of thing happens in the Bible too, and it's a big question. You know, Do we translate those literally, um, um, or do we translate the whole meaning of them? You know, you're pulling my leg. I knew a Haitian guy who was like, no, I am not pulling your leg. <laughs> you know, We understand that's an idiom. In that sense, it's misleading, but this is misleading. False friends are misleading for a different reason than that. Um, I didn't know what spilling the tea meant either. Until, I'm so I'm, I'm glad you explained it. The reason I didn't know is that I just turned 40. I'm just and I'm not in youth ministry, so um, it's a current expression. I've just never heard it before. But a false friend is a false friend, and then I realized that 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 doesn't make any sense. I don't. I'm there's no tea here. This must be an expression. A false friend is something you're liable to read right past without even realizing you're misunderstanding. What about the idiom that we played a few episodes ago? Cursed is a man that pisseth against the wall. In that same video I talked about where I talked about the bad words in the King James, that was one I talked about. And, uh, um, of course, Stephen Anderson has this famous video in which he makes um, he, just, he makes one big error. and then, One? Yeah, just one. Okay. And then actually says something I tend to agree with. Okay, here's, here's the error. Um, he takes this as normative, as if the Bible, by using this idiom, is saying that's the way all men ought to urinate. Boy, this is awkward to talk about. Uh, but we got to, it's in the Bible, okay? So the modern translations, I think all of them that I've checked, the major modern evangelical ones, uh, you know, they smooth that over and they just talk about men, okay? Well, my question is, in, in the Hebrew, that idiom, when David used it, what kind of feeling was he expressing? He was angry enough to murder Abigail had to come and restrain him. And of course, praise God, he was restrained and he praised Abigail for restraining him. Was that phrase meant to be offensive the way it hits our ears today? Earthy and, you know, scatological. Absolutely. So I see no problem with what the King James translators did. In fact, I, I would prefer that our modern translations, especially the more formal and literal ones, give us that. But it is an idiom. And so somebody could say, well, that was a well-known idiom for just talking about males, so we'll translate it that way. I say, I'm not so sure we know that. We don't have much Hebrew at all from outside the Old Testament. If we had letters from people and that was a common phrase, then maybe we could say that. Well, we don't. So I say, translate that one formally. So I'm with Stephen Anderson on this one very narrow point, not all the other stuff that he said, that, okay, yes, I think that is the right way to translate it. I support the King James translators in this case being formal or literal. So what is the most dangerous false friend in all of Scripture, in your opinion? Ooh, you know, I, I'm sort of happy to say that I actually don't think that there is one that is itself a big deal and is going to cause false doctrine or anything. Um, I'm not talking about massive misunderstandings here. My mind probably goes to the dead words more often, like, I just hate to see somebody read the vice list, variants, emulations, strifes in, uh, in Galatians 5, and not quite get it. I, I just want to understand what the Bible's saying. And Jesus said there are weightier matters of the law, and there are less weighty matters. Frankly, you're going to get the weightiest matters of the law if all you ever read is the King James. I did for the first 18 years of my life before, I, before my conscience allowed me to pick up a contemporary translation, right? So I'm not saying there's going to be some massive problem in your theology. You're going to, you know, dishonor Christ. I'm saying I just want to understand everything that God says to me and why would I be the exclusive user of one translation if through no fault of its own and through no fault of my own, I'm being misled at a bunch of little points. I actually counted them up. So I, I have listed about 50. I've done a couple more in other places, but I'm, I'm setting a number of 50. I've done 50 false friends on my YouTube channel, uh, about 30 videos. I did two that had 10 each. Um, I'm saying those 50 occur 1,362 times, okay? The word meat is going to mislead you a bunch of times. 
The word halt is my classic example. Go look it up. Go watch my video. It's going to mislead you. But God commendeth his love toward us. Doesn't mean what you think it means. Which of these verses is going to massively change your theology? None of them. Which, which of these verses, if you misunderstand it a little bit, is going to make you just miss a little piece of blessing and a little bit of understanding that's going to add to your picture of Christ in whose image you're supposed to be formed by all this Bible reading? Well, all of them. I just want to understand all of it. And if people say, well, they're not a big deal. You're making such a big deal out of such, such a small thing. I say, well, actually, if it's not a big deal, then why are you insisting so hard on holding on to it? Why can't we update these things? So then can you correctly, just as an example, exegete, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. If it's not what we think, how would that text be taught correctly from someone who understands from a Greek perspective? Actually, this is another one of those passages where even though nearly no one knows what the King James translators intended by commendeth, and I have done the work on this, I'm not making this up, um, the context is so clear that you can't miss the overall point. You know, if you know, someone might dare to die for a righteous person, but God blah, 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 his love toward us in that while we are sinners, Christ died for us, it has to mean Overall, he demonstrates or shows his love for us. But what you miss, because this is a false friend, if you do the hard work, you look at the Greek, and then you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, the King James translators were adding a little bit of meaning that actually I would say wasn't quite in the text. I don't think they did wrong to do this. I think translators can do this on occasion. Um, they're adding this kind of meaning. You know, we've got this black tablecloth here. When you put a diamond on black velvet, you are setting off that diamond, um, showing off its beauty by putting it against a dark backdrop. That is what the English word commend used to mean. That was one of its senses back in 1611. So what the King, King James translators were saying was, you know, God put his love for us on this black velvet cushion in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I, that, that really preaches, you know, and that, that is what they said. But if you try to think about this, what does commend mean today? I mean, what would you guys say? Recommend. Yeah. I, I commend this to you, yeah. or I received a commendation. Try that in that context. God recommends his love toward us. Like, my love is a good thing. Take a look at it. Well, maybe that's kind of weird. Or God commends his love like I receive a commendation. Like, good job, love. That doesn't make sense either. This is what I call a contextual conflict that shows us, no, we must be misunderstanding what the King James translators meant. It's strange that the King James translation of that particular word in that verse waters down the true meaning. Because when you translate it like you just explained, man, I, I got chill bumps. That, that saying that when God puts his love on display to the extent that it expresses all the glory that's contained within it, in that while we were still sinners, Christ, this perfect, holy, sinless one that came down from heaven, manifest in the flesh, died for us. Yeah. Wow, that's such a better translation yes, okay. than commendeth. My, my pastor's wife um, heard me give some of this material in a Sunday school years ago, and she, she really listened. She's a, she's a nurse, a sharp lady, and she said, how about the word showcases? I said, yes, that's it. That is effectively what the King James translators were trying to say. God showcases mm. his love toward us. So really, the Greek word just means shows. God shows his love toward us. They added the cases part. But they used their English and not ours. And so when I realized this, I really thought to myself, I hope this doesn't sound prideful. I really thought, I think I'm the only person on the planet who knows what the King James translators actually meant. And to this day, I've never seen anybody else say that today. Matthew Henry's commentary, if you read it that way at this passage and read it with my understanding, I think it makes a lot better sense. I really think I'm right here. Some of these things, you, you, language interpretation doesn't always bring 100% certainty. Here's the crazy thing. I've always been told that guys like you, and now me, but guys like you are just trying to destroy God's word. It sounds to me like, and it looks to me like, and you're demonstrating that you're trying to build it up and trying to unpack all of its beauty and put that on display for people. I, you don't sound like a guy that's trying to attack 
the veracity of God's word. And, and I was taught my love for the word in a King James only church. I really do not feel that I am radically discontinuous from what, you know, what I was taught there. I think I'm living true to the principles that they taught me, and I am lovingly calling them to live true to those principles as well. We've got to understand what God says. <laughs> Mark, will you tell us the story of how you realized there were false friends in the King James Version? It's a lot like what you were just saying, Nathan, that um, I was tasked with, I was called to teach the Bible to others, right? So I'm trying to understand it as well as I can so that I can help others understand. I was writing an eighth grade Bible textbook on stories in the Old Testament. It was really fun. And I, BJU Press that I worked for at the time had a, uh, you know, we had a policy to use only the King James because it was the least objectionable, I guess, you know, to, to our market at the time. Um, and yet we knew that our Bible textbooks were being used by schools that had the NIV or the ESV or the New American Standard or what have you, New King James. So I had to check all these other translations just to make sure that I didn't write anything in the textbook that would be just you know impossible to understand by a child who's using the NIV, let's say. So I was checking all the translations, which I was only too eager to do. I've been doing that for 20 years now. And I, I was writing about 1 Kings 18, the story of yeah, it's a really dramatic story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, um, you know, this contest with the priests of Baal. I actually just listened to it again in my New King James audio Bible. And he says these stirring words that I must have heard in sermons, I don't know how many times. I had them memorized just from that. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And I, you know, can I stop here and say, you know, before anybody here read my book, what would you have thought halt? in that context means stop. I've gotten that answer from people. I've asked a hundred people, 200, um, or I get waver. Okay. Those are the two things I always hear. I heard it preached as waver growing up. Okay. And that I think is again, the same thing operating where the whole context makes it clear enough what we're talking about, you know, indecision, wavering, but I always heard it as stop. How long halt ye? You're standing in between these two poles, the, the Lord opinion poll and the Baal opinion poll, and you're just standing right there. So when I read the ESV and it said, how long will you go limping between two opinions? I thought, that's not right. It says stop. And the King James translators were not dummies and the ESV translators were not dummies. You know, by the way, that's a really good principle to use. If you can't figure out why a given translation differs, start with the assumption that they were not dummies and they had some reason for it, even if you come to disagree with it. That's just humility. That's Christian charity. So I went and looked. I went and looked at the Hebrew. That's the standard, right? Um, and the Hebrew, it was limp. So I was like, did the King James translators make an error? I, I, don't, I don't expect that of them. They were brilliant guys. And I started thinking, I realized, duh, in the New Testament, Jesus heals the halt and the blind the lame, the limping. How long halt ye between two opinions means how long are you, are you going to go limping back and forth between the Lord and Baal? Are people radically misunderstanding the passage because of this false friend? No. Is every sermon ever preached on it from the King James wrong? No. But I want to get every bit of meaning that the Lord inspired that I can and I want to understand everything the King James translators put in there. And this false friend misled me and it was, it was at that moment I realized there's a phenomenon here. And soon I found a label for it, and the rest is history. So, Mark, two questions uh, that I would ask. Are you saying to our audience that the King James Version is impossible to read? And also, wouldn't difficult words be included in new translations or modern translations as well? Yeah, those are... Fantastic questions and all. Uh, I have long videos about each of them. I'll try to summarize. I'm absolutely not saying that the King James Version is impossible to read. And hear me here out there in you know YouTube land and podcast land. This is what you are going to hear from King James only leaders. If the Lord in his mercy gets me closer to public enemy number one in King James onlyism, you're gonna hear people saying, that foolish brother says you don't need a dictionary uh, or that foolish brother says you shouldn't look stuff in a dictionary. He's dumbing down the Bible, and he's saying that King James is impossible to read. Pfft, what a fool. That's already been happening to me. 
and I will willingly suffer that kind of abuse. I've expected it. But if anybody listens, I am not saying that. I am saying language changes over time. If you go back and read Beowulf, the poem, it is English, but you can't understand even really a syllable of it. Our English, okay, um, the, the King James English is somewhere in between Beowulf and our English. Are we going to wait until the King James is completely unintelligible? It is not there, right? It's not there. But how far are we going to let it get before we say, you know, it really is time for us to revise even just the English, you know, forget textual criticism. We don't have to agree on that. I don't care. It's the TR only folks who are saying that's the big deal. No, I'm saying the big deal is edification requires intelligibility. How many false friends and dead words need to stack up in D.A. Waits defined King James Bible and in the TBS word list and in the David Daniel thing that he put out to put an insert in your Bible? When is that going to get thick enough that people wake up and say, I'm under a new kind of, you know, I'm under a new kind of authoritarian sin, not too far distant from what we talked about the, the Catholic view of centuries ago, where they're telling me I can't have the Bible in my language. So I, I encourage people to go to their pastor and say, Pastor, I'm having a hard time understanding. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not understanding zero of it, but often I'm just struggling. Can you recommend a Bible translation that's easier for me to read? So we talked about the Hawaiian pigeon version, and I once had Nathan read John 3.16 from the Hawaiian Pigeon Version, and we laughed. You know, it was hilarious to hear him read it. Half yet, of the hotel staff got saved outside of the room when I read that. I mean, just <laughs> revival failed. Yeah, I thought it was even over half. It, it, look, it was such a great revival, it spilled over to the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he read from the Hawaiian Pigeon Version, and then we hear this story where it's actually used and it's actually effective to that demographic, that group of people. I think that's what you're describing. Well, what, what lay speakers of English who you know, haven't dug into linguistics do extremely well is speak their English. By the time you're two, you can understand incredibly well. By the time you're 10, you've pretty much got it mastered. You might not be able to write as well. That's a further skill. It's almost like another language in itself with all the apostrophes and stuff. Like my, my poor little girl thought the contraction for will not is willn't until she finally got to won't in her like, you know, second grade, you know, speller thing. Um, but that that kind of thing shows only the the linguistic uh, what's the word I want? I mean, kids are amazing at their ability to learn this stuff. What they're not, what people are not so good at is describing their language. They know something sounds right or wrong, but they can't say why. They know a word means this and not that, but they don't really understand why. Something else people don't understand is, and, but they ought to because they watch enough British TV, I bet, is that there are different Englishes. British English overlaps substantially with American English, but it's not the same. Boot means cleat, boot means trunk, okay? Lorry means truck. And it goes beyond that too, to little things you just wouldn't expect. Kenyan English is even further distant. Singaporean English is even further distant. They still substantially overlap. At some point, it's like that Venn diagram, they separate enough that in the judgment of church leaders in a given place, you know, we, we need a new translation. And that's the way Hawaiian pigeon is. I went and looked this up because I heard King James only folks mocking it. Um, and there was a there was a nasty tone in that that really riled me. And I looked it up and Wikipedia, good old Wikipedia, and it and it said very clearly, this is what people actually speak day to day. And for us to mock it because it sounds dumb to us is to show our ignorance. We don't know how language works. We don't understand that there can be another kind of English that's substantially similar but also substantially different. And the and the the differences are enough to cause confusion. So. As when that point comes, we need to create a new translation. And that point has come between Elizabethan English and contemporary English. They've pulled apart enough that it's not completely unintelligible. It's sufficiently unintelligible that now is the time to either use a contemporary translation. And I don't care which major modern evangelical one that you use. They're all good. Or if you say, nah, I'm really a TR guy, fine. Use the New King James, the modern English version, because edification requires intelligibility. The King James is not totally unintelligible. The modern translations do have difficult words, but they tend to be difficult things. 
what the new what the modern translations don't have or hardly ever have is archaic words words that you don't realize you're misunderstanding because of language change i experienced what he's talking about i'd been in africa for a few weeks i'd lost weight because i was trying to eat the african food and where i was located was in this small village literally out in the middle of nowhere and and so we were eating the cultural food of that area which was unlike anything I'd ever eaten before in an environment that I'd never eaten in before. And I finally boarded my British Airways flight to leave. And uh, in a nice uh, British accent, I was asked the question, would you like a biscuit? And I said, man, would I love one? (laughs) Please bring me a biscuit. And then I was brought a small cookie. And I thought there's been a mistake. Like I wanted mine with ham or sausage or egg, egg and cheese. And so I said, excuse me, I asked for a biscuit and someone brought me this cookie by mistake. And and she looks at me in all sincerity and says, but that is a biscuit. Yeah, that's, that's language for you. And if you can multiply that, beyond the stuff that you kind of learn from funny stories like this and from watching BBC television shows, to all kinds of absolutely random stuff, like the phrase, so that, 1 Kings 8.25 8, in the high priestly, not the high priestly prayer, the, uh, the temple dedication prayer that Solomon uses, uh, which is so beautiful, and he talks, I was just listening to this, about, um, you know, if somebody comes to your temple and, you know, ask for forgiveness, will you please heal them, he says to the Lord. In the King James, I'm going to quiz you guys on this one, because I don't think you've seen this video, and that's okay. And, and I'm not trying to set you up to look dumb. I, I gave exactly the same answer. He says, therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, that thou promised him, saying, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. What does so that mean in this context? Well, you would think that there would be a king who would walk in his way so that the people, I mean, that seems to be the obvious thing. So in order to get this end result. Right. So that, in order that, with the result that. Um. Uh, a graduate of Ambassador Baptist College. He's become a good friend of mine. Never met him in person. I won't give his name. Uh, he was a missionary on the mission field with the King James Only Mission Board. He sent this to me, and he said, that puzzled me. That doesn't make sense. There, there will not fail a, a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel in order that your children take heed to their way. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be instead of the result, it would be the condition? So he went and looked up, so that... An utterly random thing in an obscure verse, a beautiful passage. Everyone, everyone's going to think it means in order that. He looked it up in the OED because he'd been watching my videos and he knew the drill. There is a sense of so that, that meant in 1611, provided that, or if only. And sure enough, the Hebrew is if only. It's a condition. No man will fail to sit in my sight on the throne of Israel, provided that, if only, your children take heed to their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. It's exactly the opposite. Instead of being a result, it's a condition. And you can say, people ought to get their dictionaries out. And I'm sorry, it makes me righteously angry. It really does. No one is going to think of this, honestly, unless they've watched my videos or read other nerdy stuff like that. They're not going to notice this. And this is, this is the word of God being made void by tradition. Here's several words of God. Sorry, you can't have them. You can't read something that is in your English and you can understand them. Yeah, and it makes no sense that it's okay for 15 centuries to do translations and to continue to try to bring God's word to the common man. And then all of a sudden, in the 16th century, it's not okay to do that anymore. Man, right. That's a great point. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Mark, you, you've done a really good job of showing the problems that are caused by language change for contemporary readers of the King James Version. So in the chapter that you deal with this in the book, by the way, a lot more extensively, and I, I suggest and, and recommend there are more jokes. To, our, to, our, to our listeners, 
But you also do a really cool job, and I love this about you, man. You've got a gracious spirit and heart. You talk a lot about the good things that the King James Version brought to use over the centuries and the, and the positive things. Can you dive into a few of those? Yeah, you know, that's where I start the book, and thank you for asking that question, because I don't want anybody to think I'm attacking the King James. It is exactly the opposite. I am trying to support the mission of the King James translators, which they got from William Tyndall, which he got from Jesus Christ. And like you said, church history, there's a long tradition of doing Bible translation. And of course, you translate it into the language people actually speak. So um, my supporting, my, my mentioning of these false friends is in absolutely no way a criticism of the King James. In fact, I say not a single negative word in that entire book about any decisions of the King James translators. I think they did excellent work. They were just translating into a different English. And when they did, they produced something truly beautiful and lasting, and it's had a massive impact on our language, and I'm thankful for it. So a couple things that we lose as it ceases to be our common standard, and I recognize these are good things that we're losing. We lose a source of illusions. <laughs> you know, you can quote the King James in just a little phrase, and everybody knows you're quoting the Bible, even a lot of non-Christian people. That's valuable. As a writer, I miss that. I can't always rely on that now, if I quote the ESV. We also had, um, when we had only one standard, we didn't have all these fights, right? Yeah. People, you know, it's, I, I wrote an article about another new Bible translation, and even I said, you know, I'm a big fan of them all. I'll be happy to have the new one, sure, but a rising tide is sinking all boats. I understand why a lot of Christian people are like, why do we need another one? Are they just in it? for the money. I, un I understand that impulse. I don't think it's accurate ultimately, but um, when we had just the King James effectively, we didn't have to have that fight. Um, there, there was a connection between generations that the King James served. It was special to pray with your grandma, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when I'm on my deathbed, I'm, t I'm telling you, I I'm going to want to hear some King James words. I want to hear Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, even though want is a false friend. It means lack, not desire. And I've checked with people that I assumed would know this. A really simple, easy one. They didn't know this. But I want to hear the King James. It's, it's still you know, a bomb for my heart. Uh, but I have to take all the valuable things that the King James gave us and that, yes, we are losing as it just you know, statistically ceases to be the common standard of the English-speaking church. And I have to weigh them against what the Bible says I should value. And here I'm going to go again. Edification requires intelligibility. I think that outweighs all the cultural benefits that we get. And we can get new cultural benefits from, from what, what comes next. Yeah. I want us to play a video right here. And this is a video. I'm just going to shoot straight with our listeners. Mark wasn't completely comfortable with it because it's, it's disrespectful. And I, I just want to contrast Mark's heart and honestly all of our hearts at this table. Uh, for God to be honored, for the scripture and the gospel to be spread throughout the world. But we are represented as fools. We're represented as perverters of scripture and purveyors of perversion. And that is just not honest. And honestly, we, we all went through middle school, right? Where the number one game is tear other people down to build yourself up. And I want to play this video that uh, anyone who's associated with their good anonymous friend, uh, IFB Sermons, uh, has seen this and other videos from this guy. And I just want, honestly, in this moment of, of I, I feel the weight of this conversation and the seriousness and the gravity of it. But the respectful conversation that we're having right here, I want that to be contrasted with this. What I got here sitting here tonight on, on this platform, I got T-bone steak, brother. I, I, I've heard people say things like this before. They, they say things, brother Fred, like, well, I, 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 I read them other versions every once in a while. You know, I'll read some of them other versions and, and I'll get a little nugget out of them. And I think to myself, why in God's name would you call through a septic tank to get a nugget when you got T-bone steak sitting on the table at the house? I ain't got to crawl through a bless God septic tank that the devil has flush the sewer into to try and get a little nugget. I got steak. I got ribeye at the house. Yeah, that's 
That's right. That's right. Look here. You say, oh, we need something. We need, we need something deeper. That's plenty deep enough, brother. That's plenty all you need right there. I promise you that. That'll drown you right there. It's not just meat and it's not just water and it's not just bread, but I just read to you here. And you can also write down 1 Peter 2, 2. It's also milk. 1 Peter 2.2 2 said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. That milk is the nectar of God. It helps us grow. It puts growth in us. It supplies that which our body needs. It's water. It's bread. It's meat. It's milk. And then it gets better than that. You got a sweet tooth tonight? God said He'll even give you something for the sweet tooth. Look at Psalm 19. So guys, there's a lot that I take from that clip, but one thing that is just highly noticeable, he assumes that all of those verses refer to the King James Bible. And I think that's why the next conversation we're going to have is going to be so important, the value of using multiple English Bible translations, because I think the next conversation is going to speak to his incorrect assumptions. That's good. Coming up next week. Can't wait to jump into that one. Hey, we want to thank our sponsor here at the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast, Free Life Soap. Check them out today by going to recoveringfundamentalist.org. Click on the Free Life Soap tab. Use your promo code RFP. Get 20% off of your order. Be back here with us next week as we wrap up this four-part series talking about the value of using multiple English Bible translations. It's going to be a good one. Can't wait. We'll see you all next week. Be sweet. Peace. Let's go. Thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Be sure to stop by our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. That's recoveringfundamentalist.org. There you can find Recovering Fundamentalist swag. You can get your T-shirts and hats. You can join our ex-fundy community. See where we're going to be having some meetups. It's the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Be sure to join us next time for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. <laughs>